I'm going to hand over to Dr. Nikki Brunker, who is going to now help us practically find the wriggle room and think more deeply about how we're going to do that. So Nikki, over to you. Thanks, Virginia. Hello, everybody. Uh, I guess we're going to uh, build on the idea of, of wriggle room to think through your understanding, your thinking in terms of what's been happening through the conference so far. So I'm going to share my screen and go back to the Padlet that you used. Thank you for, to the people who have uh, shared some insight into the Wriggle Room that you're finding. This time Wriggle Room is something that we use a lot here you know, with our pre-service teachers, but I also use it when I'm mentoring teachers as well. It's that idea of the space that we can find within our day, our week, our term, to enable building greater creativity within our classrooms. And I think what really shines through in the contributions to the homework on the Padlet is that we have to be incredibly creative to find the ways to enable creativity for our students. Some of the constraints that people were talking about, uh, people talking about the constraint of time is the biggest issue and how the constraints actually increase with the age of students given the other demands on what is going on. There was also an interesting comment that was raised in the homework around the idea of needing to hide our wriggle room at times hiding from leadership, hiding from parents, that we might be engaging in greater creativity rather than other approaches to teaching and learning that may be more expected within a school environment. I was really intrigued. Uh, one of the comments was around greater demand for explicit teaching. And that's one of the things I look at with pre-service teachers and mentoring teachers as well, is that explicit instruction is actually a crucial part of creativity. It's the where and the how and the when that we do that. It's not the dominant approach to teaching and learning. And I think when we're uh, encouraged to take it as more of a dominant approach, those constraints have ramped up. So it was interesting to consider how you're managing and the different perspectives coming from Steiner and other people who are in uh, different environments. And it was tricky trying to get an idea of where some of you are. And that might be something we might explore through what we're going to do now. So uh, Thomas is going to give you all a invitation to join a breakout room in a moment. We're going to leave you fairly much to your own devices for this activity. This is your chance to get active, to put your thinking out there and for us to build upon what you're thinking around creativity. So on the Padlet, on the far left-hand side is the activity for the breakout groups. What I'm using is a thinking routine from Project Zero. And if you're not familiar with the Project Zero thinking routines, they can be a really useful structure, a scaffold for developing creativity through uh, collaborative thinking in classrooms. So if you're not familiar, I've actually put a link... Oh, no, it's not actually working. All right, I'll throw a link onto Padlet for you so you can go there if you are not familiar with their fantastic resources. But what I'm doing is using their thinking routine of stories. And there are three main questions that I want you to think about in your group. What is the story of creativity that has been presented across the conference? Okay, so what is the account that is told, has been told? What is the untold story around creativity? What is left out in the account of creativity that we've heard so far? And what other angles are missing in the account that we've, we've been engaged with so far? And that then leads to the final question that I want you to think through in your small groups. Draw on the wriggle room, draw on what people have put on the Padlet, draw on your own experience to think through what is your story? What is your story of creativity? Now, there's a few ways you can look at that. It might be what is your experience of creativity, but it might be stepping beyond that to your understanding of creativity and your consideration to how we can engage more with creativity and how we can push back on the constraints around what's preventing us from doing what we're, what we're aiming for with creativity. So in thinking through what is your story, and I mean the group story, bringing that together, what is the account that you think should be told? To whom and by whom? 
So getting you to start thinking about where's the wriggle room that we can be using to move beyond our own classrooms, beyond our own schools, looking at what's been identified in the discussion on the homework around the gap between policy and practice. Picking up on what Robin and Michael were talking about last week, how do we actually start expanding our wriggle room to impact policy? Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is to develop some response to your story on creativity. Now, it might be a written response. It could be an audio recording of you talking through that response. It could be a film recording. It could be drawn. Whatever you'd like to do, there's some instructions on this piece in the Padlet that explains how to do that. So again, using the cross down the bottom right hand corner to make your new post. If you can please pop your names in, that would be really helpful so that each of you can follow up if there's someone you particularly want to talk with. And there's some instructions there in terms of if you want to do straight written post and audio, etc. If you're unfamiliar with going into breakout groups, talk with people about that when you go into the room. There is a function that you can call somebody in, okay? So I will be watching those messages and I will come into your group if you call me in. I'm not going to come in unless you call me, okay? It's terribly intrusive when people just land their head in your breakout room. So please, if you'd like me, call me in. So Thomas, if you could open up the breakout room so everybody can join their group. Thank you. Welcome back everybody as you um, drift back into the screen. I often feel like I'm creating some sort of thought experiment when I make breakout rooms and people go flying across. Remember that old philosophy um, thinking of there's somebody on Mars with brains in a vat stirring wildly controlling us all. That's how I feel with breakout rooms. Um, it was interesting popping in and out of a couple of groups and hearing different perspectives. The thing I wanted to explore as you came back from your small groups was looking at how the wriggle room you access within your day-to-day -day teaching could be built upon to build wriggle room in that divide between policy and practice. And a couple of things jumped out at me in hearing different groups. The constraints that people are feeling within Steiner education and within Steiner schools, and the recognition that there's actually movement happening within mainstream schools. And I thought that was an interesting thing to explore. Oh. Uh, and then the last thought in the last group that I was just in then was that the idea of a lack of fresh literature in Steiner schooling and practice. And before we move into the panel, because we've only got a very short period of time, is there anybody who would like to share thoughts thinking about the story of creativity that's been presented so far and how that can continue to unfold to look at the constraints and push back on those constraints within your own school and beyond? Nikki, I'd just like to say the word coherence come, is coming up for me from everywhere. So finding the, the wriggle room uh, through really knowing what your story is and, and being willing to stand behind it. Uh, so it's the coherence of the um, story the um, your purpose and your practice and that surely is very powerful to be able to stand behind that and to value difference like really and truly even though there's coherence in uh, an, in a school not a whitewashing difference within that coherence as well so diversity within coherence is a challenge but that's a way to consciously find that and, and act out that wriggle room in a broader space. That comes back, the group I started with was talking about eurythmy, which in, in exploring the concept of eurythmy and the practice of eurythmy, really highlights that creativity is at the center of Steiner philosophy. 
And then as I joined other conversations and, and was reading what was coming up on the Padlet, there's a lot of consideration to creativity being pushed to the edges. There was a comment about, I think it was from your group, Virginia, about creativity being the token Christmas activity. And there was talk about uh, demands for greater explicit teaching. And I think what's really struck me, I wasn't actually prepared. I was, it's unexpected for me to hear a group of Steiner teachers talking about creativity being something they're struggling to find the space for or, or needing to find the wriggle room. I suppose I was expecting to hear how central it is and that it's pervasive across everything. But I've heard people actually feeling an enormous tension yeah there is a there is a tension and it's got to be brought to the surface and that storytelling which is so part of the Steiner context um, can be utilized richly uh, to great effect to, to stand behind but it, it, it it's got to be real and uh, the shared language, you know, it, it's all part of that as well. Um, but yeah, these well, things have to be grappled with. Yes, I'll hand that to you then, Virginia, so that we can move on with the panel. Thank yeah, you, everybody. Great. Well, thank you, Nikki. That's a fantastic activity. And thank you, everybody, for participating. And we are going to move very quickly along to our reflection and plenary where Michael I believe you are going to do a wonderful job at helping us draw the threads together or um, asking the right questions there's Nikki Michael Robin Matthew and Nicole who are here to draw together the threads and I'd love to get a call to action out of this as well so Michael, okay, Virginia, you built that up. I hope I can deliver for you. Let's yeah. see. <laughs> I have built it up, haven't I? <laughs> okay. Uh, so lots of really interesting themes emerging. Uh, that one around coherence and creativity is fascinating. What I might do is do two things. For everyone, uh, I wonder if there are big questions for you, uh, everyone on the Zoom, if there are big questions for you, if you would put those big questions in the chat box. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to those big questions. But in the interim, what I'd like to do is just to uh, kind of go to the panel and just ask them what they have noticed from the the three or so the two days that we've had together what are the big noticings that have come up um and how have those noticings uh changed or kind of made them think differently about steiner education or education generally uh matthew i might go to you first sorry that was a question without notice but about noticing, uh, but while everyone's putting in their big questions, I'd love to get your take on that. Um, well, I think one of the big notices is the obvious disconnect that we're having between um, the policy positions that are, are arising, like the Alice Springs uh, Declaration and its predecessor, the Melbourne Declaration, and its prioritization of these soft skills, as they're sometimes called, or 21st century skills, whatever you want to use, including critical and creative thinking, as a priority, because we're looking at trying to generate a new um, uh, generation of students uh, that are producers rather than consumers, because of, uh, you know, there's all sorts of literature around why we need to do this. So this is the push, but at the same time, we want to see measurable and short term goals achieved which is putting us towards that explicit and direct teaching st structures, mostly through the assessment. So I'm seeing that those tensions are probably the big, uh, big tensions that are existing. And for us within Steiner Education, my uh, um, perspective on this is that because we're not finding as much wriggle room uh, in 
dealing with these because we haven't gone to enough depth into the things that confront us, like assessment. And when we go into the depth, into the details, then we can find more wiggle room within, within them. So we wind up, find ourselves, because we've got boxes to tick, that we're stepping for more and more along the lines of what's uh, the conventional. So I, should, I think that dancing that particular divide for us is probably uh, the big one. And how do we actually uh, attack that? I don't yeah, know if that answers your question, Michael. Uh, it comes close, I think. And, uh, you know, in the great Steiner tradition, there's no wrong answer. Um, uh, but absolutely, that, that gets us going beautifully, I think. And I, I want to come back to kind of wriggle room because I think uh, it's such an interesting idea. And I want to come back to, to Nikki for a response on this. I wonder whether wriggle room is actually a slightly limiting concept in some ways. Is it actually about, uh, because we sometimes talk about wriggle room when we're talking about politicians, how they kind of get out of something, you know, when uh -huh. Gladys says she didn't quite have the test at the right time, et cetera, et cetera, for those of us in New South Wales. Um, but I wonder whether it's dancing the divide rather than wriggle room. I know, I know there's, a, there's a difference uh, and, you know, I don't think there's any problem with the term, but I'm just wondering, does wriggle mean going deeper sometimes? We start wriggling and then we start digging in the way that Matthew's suggesting. I think that's a really important point uh, in terms of the subterfuge of wriggle room. And that was raised in the homework, that idea of actually needing to hide practice from leadership, from teachers. And... That, I think that we do need to consider that in terms of wriggle room. But I also think that wriggle room is often the starting point. So yes, it does need to go deeper. And I think it's the stepping stone to which we can dance the divide. It's once people find a bit of wriggle room, they can see the response from, their, from the learners within their own classes, that they have a little bit of um, groundwork. They've got the evidence to put back to people to say, this is why I'm doing this. This is what I can see coming from it. This is why we need to be able to expand. So I think the wriggle room gives us the basis on which to start pushing back. And that then gives us the room to start dancing that divide to be able to say, okay, well, this is the demand placed upon us. And this is what we believe. This is what is important to us. So how do we respond to the demand rather than allow the demand to lead us, which leaves us with the, our wriggle room being the hidden practice yeah great uh and it's interesting that which is hidden becoming apparent is so important so it, it's not actually about something we're hiding it's something we want to celebrate because the things uh that nicole uh robin myself were talking about in, in a sense they shouldn't be hidden. They should be out there because they're the things we're doing education for. We're not doing education for endlessly doing NAPLAN uh, tests. We're doing education for to to make deep learning possible. I might go uh, to Nicole Ostini now. What do you think, Nicole? Like, what have, what have you noticed around uh, the two days that we've had together? Maybe that Nicole's either not online or, or still muted. So in the meantime, we'll go to Robin Ewing. Uh, sorry, I'm back on. Uh, no worries. <laughs> Did you hear the question, Nicole? Um, I think so. I think um, for me, there's this real question around um, like uh, uh, having consciousness and awareness for me, like in particularly with movement, it kind of starts as something that you try and make space for or something that you add, or it becomes, okay, well, this, I'll start with something that's movement and then we'll go ahead with the rest of the lesson or something like that. Um, and I think what everyone's sort of bringing just now is the fact that what we're really aiming for is the integration so that these things aren't compartmentalised into segments, but that the movement is the learning. Um, and for me, I hope that's the kind of take home is that movement itself is a brain activity, is an intellectual learning activity. Um, so that the more that we can actually bring our content through movement rather than 
thinking of it in terms of like a brain break where people just get up and have a bit of a movement and then start their intellectual class again. Um, but the more that we can actually integrate it into the learning process itself, that to me um, dissolves the borders and the divide and actually just um, brings that sense of whole back to what we do. And I, I, I mean, really what you're arguing for is a kind of a holism where we're not thinking about the brain and the body as two separate entities, but but actually joined up as of course they always have been. We've just managed to disengage them a la Ken Robinson um, for our schooling. And I, and I want to throw to Robin now, who has been a kind of a champion for holistic education pretty much all her career. Robin, what have you noticed around some of the discussions you've been hearing? Well, the first one that I think is really encouraging is that we're all on the same page. You know, we, mm. we all um, want this um, change to happen. You know, we, we don't really want to be having to dance a divide. We want to find a way for, um, you know, to, uh, to move that divide <laughs> um, into the kind of teaching and learning that that is holistic, that, that does take account of the whole child, wherever that whole child or young person is. And I, I like Nikki's idea of the wriggle room being the stepping stone to what I've always talked about based, you know, on, on what others have said, and that's the spaces and places to play. Um, and as Matthew said, you know, um, well, Matt, I think Matthew, you really underlined the need for us to be to be courageous in the contexts that we are in to take the time to allow our imaginations, um, you know, to be nurtured and developed and fostered, and. I think that's another thing that then I, I noticed a lot about um, our concern about time and the constraints of time. And Nikki talked about how, um, you know, we have to be creative with our time. Mm. Um, I think we also have to be brave enough to know that we have to slow down what's happening despite the speeding up. And interestingly, um, Sui in, in our group from Malaysia talked about how she thought sometimes there was more openness to play and, and um, imagination in the early years, but the further we got, you know, into um, the older grades, the less preparedness people were. So, uh, yeah. Um, I'm playing with um, how we can take dancing the divide, which I think has been a really fabulous way of conceptualising what we've talked about in this conference to, to what needs to be the next step. That's great, Robin. Thank you. Uh, look, I've noticed something similar. I've, uh, because it is one of the things that I've been writing about and thinking about for many years, the concept of coherence has come up. And I think um, as educators, we get lots of disparate ideas that are fabulous, you know, uh, but how you bring them all together in a coherent kind of learning system it is really the challenge. I, I thought I'd make an offer actually today because uh, I didn't get to it when uh, we were talking in the, uh, in the, in the other session. Uh, and it's, it's about a coherence maker we've done around pedagogy because we were talking about pedagogy uh, a, little, uh, a little bit before and it occurred to me that this might be useful as a coherence maker for pedagogy. This comes from our new book. So you are getting it, um, you know, straight out of the gates or <laughs> you may not want that, but that's, that's, uh, that's what it is. Uh, we call this the pedagogy parachute. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was try and map for schools all of the pedagogies that are possible and get them to think about what they're doing and what they're not doing and where they're doing it. Um, 
it's still a work in progress to a certain extent, but one of the things that we wanted to try and do is, and you notice, for instance, it's not called direct instruction, it's called motivated instruction. We think there's some bog standard pedagogy going on in some places, probably not Steiner schools, but in other places. And how you can actually uh, understand how to move something which is not particularly inspiring in terms of pedagogy to something that the evidence and the research says is inspiring. And in this little coherence maker, uh, I think about what Virginia was saying before about, you know, we've got so much, uh, we've got to find diversity within coherence. Uh, I think one of the things that you can do if you have a common language or a common set of languages is to find that diversity through lots of different ways of being. Uh, I just kind of offer that as a way of thinking about coherence in the same way that the learning disposition will offers an understanding of coherence. But I think if we think our pedagogy is pretty good, we've got to think about the silences as well as the noise and where we are actually putting our eggs in which baskets and how that's serving us. Um, and I think this can start to open up, but that's, that's offered, um, you know, for anyone who's interested. Um, okay, let's go to the questions. Please feel free to keep putting them up. Uh, Julia B says to uh, ask the question, Steiner teacher in mainstream schools, do you have three words of advice? Um, I might go to Matthew and Nicole Astini on that one. Maybe Nicole first. Uh, so mainstream schools. So I think um, is is to hold on to that um, knowledge and belief that what you're bringing is very innovative and that the mainstream system, although it can seem like it's pushing back with all the restrictions, is also um, saying yes to this stuff. They're also meeting this and going, um, you know, this is, this is innovative, this is where we wanna go. So um, I would really sit in what you're bringing into that mainstream school with the knowledge that what you're doing is really innovative and exciting and um, to, yeah, hold your head up high with what you're working with. That would be my advice. Matthew? Uh, I think it would depend on uh, whether you're talking about primary, early childhood or secondary uh, for me. So it's hard to give a universal advice on that one. We know. Primary school. It's primary. Yes. Um, then uh, I think one of the things we need to look for there is confidence. A student, uh, what we're trying to do here with the students is, is to build that knowledge that they know that they can. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big difference between the teacher being able to say the student knows and understands something and the student knowing that they understand something. So we want to see when we start looking at that element in what we develop in our students, that they have the confidence to know that yes, I can write my name, for instance, and that they know that they can do it well or they can do it correctly. That's what we want to see, because that's the thing that's going to nurture them. Uh, so it means you may need to go a little bit slower, um, but it definitely means that what we're trying to do there is to raise that, that interaction, that, that engagement with the student. Um, and to do that, uh, you need to have the discourse with the child. They have to tell you that they know that they can. I hope that's enough. Fantastic. Uh, we're 11.59, um, Virginia, we're going to 12, I presume? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Well, I'll, I'm just going to close up and then I'm going to throw to you, Virginia. Yeah. Sorry to any of the panel who were burning to say something. I'm sure they can say something in the chat um, if, if they've got a pearl of wisdom. I want to um, do want to mention Nikki's comment, though. It's interesting to see that metaphors of movement, dancing the divide, wriggle room, be taken in the direction of physical movement. Movement is central to Steiner education. Mm -hmm. How might that physical learning inform lead the met metaphorical movement for Steiner schools leading educational change? Mm -hmm. I think that's a fabulous, oh. I, I actually can't think of a better place to finish that discussion. Uh, I think there's big questions that are coming out about coherence, I am slightly struck that Steiner educations are strugg struggling with creativity. And I think there's certainly things we can do around that to, to support 
Steiner Education and Creativity. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities um, to do that. Um, the first tangible thing you can do is become a member of Create and you'll find out more and more <laughs> about creativity. Uh, sorry for that ad, um, but absolutely. So just from me, thank you for two days of really uh, kind of enlightening, kind of interesting discussions. Thank you to everybody who's presented uh, and thank you, Virginia, for making it all possible. Look, thank you, Michael. That's been a pleasure. I've learned so much and the collaboration has been um, very productive and I think we've got a lot out of it. But my big thing is that, you know, to have some action out of this and my key thought is to talk further, uh, Robin and Michael and others, about how we do move forward. and. I go back to the idea of telling your own story, coherence, which is a, a key word, mm -hmm. and standing behind it with confidence. Okay. And it's not polarising. So I'd like to get beyond the, you know, this is better, that's, you know, better. It's not better, it's different, and it should be allowed. So it's a different way of um, educating. Just say in the Steiner context, for instance, it's not better than, it's different, and we need difference. And that is important story to tell. And uh, not only that, is if we polarise, we back ourselves into a corner. So we need to be in there in the discourse and by force of better by force of good argument um, have a seat at the table and to not be on the margins I'm talking again about Steiner education but be part of the broader mainstream and I think uh, our education policy doesn't allow that at the moment so we need to work on doing that and one way I'd like to follow up is through that Jolly National Evidence Institute and something Robin said, which is to really let's draw together all the evidence and let's see the um, evidence that we can draw on to legitimise our practice. And of course, we need to um, generate our own research, which we are doing as well. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you to all the presenters. We've got such a rich picture of um, dancing the divide now such a good image such a such good imagery um, anybody who wishes to follow up please do so send emails um, and also especially watch the um, the youtube videos again uh, it's well worth it so thank you again